Hi, this is David Wesson, and welcome to Gloucester. Please join me as we explore the natural beauty, the history, the culture, and the amazing people. All this and more on Awesome Gloucester. In Gloucester, you can't claim to make the bread of the fishermen and take that lightly. Here at Virgilio's Bakery in Delhi, they've been making fresh bread and sandwiches for three generations. This morning, Joe and some of the boys are going to show me how it's been done since 1961. So if someone was to come in here and they like they said, really, I, I'm only here for a day. I got to try one thing. You know, what would you have them try? Start with the scallop bread. Yeah. That's the first one. Yeah. It is your original. That's the original bread. Yeah. There was a time when that's all they made. Scallop bread? Scallop bread. Uh, the bread yeah. of the fisherman. Yeah. Uh, the bread of the fisherman. Yeah. And how did it get that name? My grandfather. You'd have to ask him. Yeah. He gave it the name. Yeah. Did you, so did you grow up? Were you? Did you grow up as a kid? Were you uh, here in the bakery and you learned from him? Yeah. yeah. My whole life. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's how the magic happens. Wow. So that's going to turn into that. That's a beautiful thing. Probably in a couple hours. Nice. See, the dough's all risen in the boxes now. Put it over here. It goes through a series of rollers. Yeah. Flattens it out. And then the chain catches it, rolls it up, so that you get something nice and long that you can work with. See? Can I give one a try? You want to try one? Yeah, please. Sure. Give a little pressure, roll from the center out. New, new people, we show them like this. Yep. Like this. There you go. Woo! And then right here? Cut the loops. Cut the loops. Okay. Like that? Yep. I just cut it too much, didn't I? No, cut all the way through. All the way through? All the way through. And then just push it back together? Cut those And this two. one too? Yep. You got it. That's a scallop bread. And how, and how will I know this one's mine? All right, I'll just, the funny looking one. Bigger. All right. Just double them up. Yep. Double them. Those. Not myself. Is that good? That's good. That's right. No, okay. You gotta bring it like this. Okay. So it's gonna oh, work up a bigger bread. I lost one. <laughs> So what do we do? Uh, One man down, does it matter? Yeah. You're the pro, man. I'm, yeah, just... <laughs> that was over here, the twist? Yeah. They got it tight. Okay. We'll definitely know which one I did. Put it here. And there. And you're ready to go. All right. Thanks All so right. much, Jamie. No problem. Yeah. All right. But now they're, they're packing up their bread. They're going to load up their vans and they're going to go. Right. Um, they're gonna go deliver it. They're gonna deliver all the bread that was cooked. They've been here since probably quarter of six. And in about two hours time, we can get enough bread ready that they take off. And then the other two guys, they stay here. Yeah. And they'll continue making more bread. Um, they go through the order book, what every restaurant needs, make sure everything's getting cooked. Get it cooled off and packed up. This way when the guys come back, they can just grab the bread Load the van and, yeah. and go back out again. Yeah. It's kind of you got a smooth it, operation. It works pretty well.
scallop we made this morning. This is the scallop we made this morning. It's come out of the proofer now oh. and gone into the oh. oven. As you can see, it's got this beautiful golden crust. I do. All right. Here we go right, and just rip it out. You know out. what? I'll let All you right. break the bread. All it's right, hot. Man. Break it. Give it All a break right, in it half. A break. Oh, there you go. Oh, look, look at it steaming. Oh. Got a nice pull there. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I gotta give you a piece, man. All right, I'll try a piece together. too. Yep. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. Perfect crunch from the outside. So soft on the inside. And that's how it should be. And oh that, my God. you know, this is. I've heard people tell me, oh, you work at Virgilio's, you know, what a great tradition that is. And that's it exactly is. what this is, a tradition. It is. It you is. Know, it's yeah, I'm three generations now, and the bread hasn't changed. It's delicious. So Virgilio's is really, I mean, a family business. This is third generation. Yeah. You're a Virgilio, right? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, your father and your grandfather? My father and my uncle before me, mm -hmm. grandfather before that. Well, I'm sure your grandfather would be proud to see Oh, it's sure. still existing and, and that it's grown and that it's still in the family. I mean, that's amazing this day and age. It really is. Uh, third generation, um, uh, from what I understand, is not as common as second generation. Fourth generation, we'll have to see. I'm, yeah. I hope. Do you, do you have kids you think are going to take on the business? I have three kids that do some, do, they all do something totally different. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll see. Well, maybe, you know, I'll learn and take on the trade and, you I could have dropped you. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Yeah, <laughs> I, I look enough like you. I have no clue. 1623, I believe. 1623? 1623. 1623. Nice. 1623. <laughs> 18 something. <laughs> no, no. 1647. Ooh, close. Oh, really? No clue. Oh, right. Carolyn Kirk. Yeah. Mayor Carolyn Kirk. That's correct. Caroline Kirk. That's correct. Carolyn Kirk. That's correct. Carolyn Kirk. Uh, that Carolyn Kirk. Yes? Right. <laughs> 28,000? Ooh, very good, good guess. 29. Yeah. I'd have to say somewhere around 60,000. Actually, it's only 29,000. Really? Yeah. It's just glossy. And I'm one of them. <laughs> Roughly 30,000? Yes. Approximately 29, 30,000? Right. Year round population, the yes, permanent please. population. Uh, I'm going to say 35,000. I believe it's in the vicinity of 30,000. Nice. My goodness. Too many. <laughs> 2,400. <laughs> I don't know how to count people. Uh, it's 15 something. 60,000. 24. <laughs> Wicked tuna. <laughs> yeah. nice. uh, the fishing port, you know, uh, just out there, the, the tourism that comes through here and the fishing. Because um, uh, I lump trucks downtown, so I see all the fish that comes through here, and uh, it still needs to be the fishing port that it always was. Yeah, that's my favorite thing. It's a lot of little things about Gloucester that um, make it add up. So I don't think there's any one thing that stands out. The colors maybe at different times of day, that might be the, the most favorite thing. There are different colors that you don't see many different places and you can see them on both sides because of sunset and sunrise happening on an island. So the colors. The landscape. Favorite What's your thing? favorite thing about Gloucester, buddy? Same as you said. Same as you said. <laughs> uh, the art community. I'm also a board member of a nonprofit here in town called Sea Arts. Oh, cool. uh, and the uh, and we it's it just it's one of the most active not the most active arts community in the, in, the, in the all of New England. Wow, I mean, it's really amazing. When you look at Cape Ann as a whole, right. uh, Gloucester, Rockport, Essex, Manchester. My favorite thing about Gloucester offhand would be the tradition of the fishermen. I myself fished, and a lot of people, you know, they dug a living out of this port, and they made it what it is today. And then our fishermen are world renowned, and um, deserve a lot of respect. Live a hard life. They work for their money.
I think it's the seagulls when I'm w waking up and I, I'm walking to work at, you know, six in the morning. I like hearing nothing but those little, those little guys going crazy. <laughs> I'm at the Maritime Heritage Center where we're going to learn about their programs and check out some of their cool exhibits. Come on. We have education programs with kids that our core program is called Ocean Explorers. And Neat. today it's chock full of kids on site and yeah. seeing them around. Um, they are third, fourth, and fifth graders from all of Cape Ann, so Rockport, oh, wow. Manchester, Essex, and Gloucester. So that's so great that the, the local kids do get an appreciation and knowledge of their history and local the, the marine industrial yeah. life. And and this is something that is ongoing through their school curriculum, or is this just like a special field trip? No, it it goes throughout the year. So uh -huh. our educators have the kids come here twice in their school year. So they're here uh -huh. in the fall and in the spring. And then our educators go out into the classroom as well. So when they come on site, they if it's a nice day, they'll go out on the Ardell, which is our pinky schooner that yeah. is run by Harold Burnham, Captain Burnham. They come on land and then they meet with our educators looking at um, squid dissection. They'll roll their sleeves up and <laughs> write their names with the ink sack. It's pretty, it's pretty neat with the quilt, so wow. that's fun. Um, and then they go into our touch tank aquarium and they look at some native habitats and they look at some of the creatures that our fishermen partners bring in off their boats and help stock our, our tanks. Wow. So that's cool. So who can tell me, what do we remember about an invasive species? Are, are zombies an invasive species? <laughs> no. <laughs> they oh. move around a lot. What do you think? Um, we have a standard measurement, right, that we're measuring, um, a standard area we're measuring the growth in. Um, so what we do is over time, we compare, every time we pull these, once a week, right, we compare what we see, how many are there, how big they are, right, um, what is landed, what we don't find, um, and we keep that data for an entire year. Whoa, these things look like seaweed, but they're alive. Ew. Oh, look Exciting how fast or they totally move. disgusting. Here we go. They're little skeleton shrimp. I don't know. So you guys can start digging around in there. I'll do it if you do it. <laughs> yeah, we definitely got to roll up our sleeves. What about this? The star, the star tunicate. Let's see if we can find that. That one's pretty cool. But it's almost like a little eel. I dare you. No, you do it. I'll give you, I'll give you a dollar. No, no, no. I so think it's one of those star tunicates. All right, you ready? Here I go. Ah! I have a feeling they're just. I hope, I hope I don't go home and find these in my pocket. What's that? Oh, sorry. That would be why they call them a sea squirt. Yep, can you see? Oh, look at that. No worries. Oh, look at that guy. Look, that's a crab. That's a crab. Whoop, there he goes. Went for a dip. So who do we got in here? Well, we have our sea star, which we found out in the Gloucester Harbor. And we also have wow. this lobster, which is just a normal species of lobster, but it's called a calico lobster because what? of its rare coloring. Oh, okay, like a calico cat. Yep. Wow, and it's uh, black and orange. Because mm -hmm. cool. lobsters can come in every color except pink and purple. Right, and they're not red until they're cooked. Everyone thinks they're right. red, but yep. yeah. Whoa. I think she likes me. You see how much she calmed down? Yeah. I get the touch. She's so cool. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Wow, you found that right in the harbor. That's amazing. Yeah. It's in a lobster trap. Where do you find these kind of starfish? These kinds of starfish, like I said, you can find right out in the harbor or um, you usually see the smaller ones kind of in tide pools uh -huh. along the rocky beaches because um, they like to hang out around rocks. Uh, how long can they stay out of water like this? Um, well, the cool thing is that they don't have blood, so they use seawater instead of blood. So oh, it's wow. a good idea to keep them in the water as much as you can. I mean, they're yeah. frying out for okay. a couple minutes, but uh, All right. 
Yeah, they use the orange spot. A lot of people think that's an eye, but that actually kind of works as like a heart to pump the seawater in and out of their body. Oh, wow. Now, are these growing in number or shrinking in number due to the changes in the uh, ecosystem? They are shrinking, unfortunately. Uh. I mean, they're very sensitive to the climate and everything and the water temperatures and the pollution. Yeah. So a lot of sea stars are migrating or just dying out. And wow. uh, you don't really see too many anymore. So we were lucky to have yeah. this guy. Well, thank you for being alive and being so beautiful. And should I put her, put her yeah, or fine. him back? Yeah. Okay. That guy's freaky. Are those his eyes? Uh, yeah, his eyes are on the top. Wow. Wait, th then, those are his eyes that he's opening and closing, or those are gills to breathe? Those are for breathing. But his wow. eyes are right below it. Whoa. Yeah, so this guy's called the skate. And you find these in like the salt marshes around the edges of the harbor, you know, where they they have the long grass. It looks almost like a stingray. Yeah, they are related to stingrays, and they have the cartilage skeleton like a shark too, so they're related to sharks. Really? Yep. Whoa. Do they bite? Nope. Really? These guys. Now these guys are pretty cool. Now, do they have a gender? Yep. Um, so the males have these two things called claspers coming on each side of their tail. Okay. And then the females don't. So that one I see. over there is a female because it doesn't have the two uh -huh. claspers. And do they get, have the females gotten pregnant? Have you? Um, none of ours have in here, but this, yeah. if you've seen these, a lot of people call them mermaid purses. Mermaid this purses. Is actually a skate egg pod. So there's a little. Oh, wow. You can barely see the yolk inside. Did now, did, so that wasn't laid by one of you guys put one in here? Yeah, we found it. So it will hatch and baby skates will come out? Yep. Wow. Before you leave, just wanted to give you this. Thanks for coming by. Oh, thank you. It's what I've always wanted. Yeah, I, I thought yeah, so. Yeah, I can put it somewhere. Thanks so much. Sure it's such a pleasure yeah. to meet you. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Take care. And this is like the 100th anniversary of the development of the Mark V hat in this, this particular system. They were diving stuff similar to this all the way back to the 1850s. Um, but the Mark V was in use from by the Navy from 1915 till um, I'll say the late 70s or mid 70s. So there are a lot of the guys here, the older guys, they, they actually either dove this in school or dove it in the Navy, um, even if they never used it for work. This is just a place to mount the helmet to. That's just the breastplate that the helmet locks onto. I was wearing probably a hundred pounds of lead weights on the, on the harness. And then the boots are really just for trying to help keep you oriented properly in the water. Because now you've got this really heavy, you know, bonnet and breastplate. Um, and you really don't want to go upside down in this. Part of it was that they've had the dive locker here for, I want to say, 15 years. And um, have never put together any actual use of the equipment. It's always just been static as a display. And uh, we've always wanted to get it to the point where we're demonstrating that this, is, this does function. This is how things were done years ago. And, and uh, it's still viable. Hey, this is David Wesson with Awesome Gloucester. We're up here in the Blackburn Circle in Gloucester. We're gonna check out the new Ryan and Wood Distilleries. Handcrafted gin, vodka, whiskey, and rum. You wanna go check it out? I wanna go check it out, let's go. Good morning, you Doug? I am, David. David. Yeah, nice Welcome, to meet you. we're happy to have you here. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. Um, I've heard a lot about it and I've been wanting to uh, get a little tasting and a little experience of uh, 
Rhino Wood Distillery. You came to the right place. So what do we got in store today? Uh, well, here at the still, we're going to take a quick tour through Ryan and Wood Distilleries. We're here in the gift shop now. We're going to take a walk downstairs, check out the actual production side of things, and then we can come back up for a taste at the end. Yeah, that's what I'm really here for, so. All right, all right. well, let's get the tour out <laughs> of the way excited. then. Yeah, Great. Right. Yeah, my father and grandfather were fish cutters, so seafood processing. Started out working on the piers and then got their own outfit after that. So they would buy fish from the fishermen, cut them, pack them, and sell the fish itself. How did your father decide to make this transition? Uh, he, he was looking for something still manufacturing. As Gloucester, as the fishing's constricted quite a bit, you know, everybody used to work in one of the plants or one yeah. of the boats. So he still wanted to make something in town and manufacture, but be part of the change to destination dining, tourism, in that transformation. If it was pure strategy, my father Bob, my cousin Dave probably would have started in downtown Boston. Um, but part of their deal was, after so many people have taken a lot of money from the ocean, we wanted to show that you could choose an industry, you know, Gloucester being synonymous with fish, we wanted to cho choose an industry that was foreign to here, bring it into Gloucester and show that you could have a viable business that way. All right, David, we got a little hands-on work for you now. All right, so I see you, uh, you named the tanks after uh, the local uh, schooners. That's right, these are two rum fermentation tanks. They're actually big dairy chillers that we repurposed uh, yeah. when we started making rum. So we have the Thomas Lannan and the Adventure, two of the schooners in the harbor. All right, I'm gonna get into it. We just need you to give this a gentle stir. This All is right. actually uh, hundreds of pounds of Louisiana molasses, a little bit of water, and some yeast. And this is a rum fermentation. It smells so, really sweet. Yep, it's a very confectionery sort of smell from all that burnt sugar in the molasses. Um, so this is actually the yeast fermenting the sugar from the molasses, creating alcohol as a byproduct. And what is the, the stirring doing for it? We're just trying to mix it up, make sure this, the yeast get access to all the sugar content as it's been sitting here for a couple days. Um, we want to get a good yield from the sugar we put in there so we can get a lot of rum as a result. This, in just a couple days, we'll pump into the still, and we're going to do the actual distillation to get an unaged rum distillate out of this product. This looks like something from Young Frankenstein. Yep. I, I, this is an amazing piece of machinery. Will you tell me what I'm looking at here? We're looking at the heart of the operation here at Ryan and Wood, the actual still. So as anybody who cooks with wine knows, alcohol will boil off at a lower temperature before the actual water will. So we've got this big kettle, we're going to then raise the temperature of this kettle to a point a little above about 90 degrees Celsius where the alcohol will boil off, but the water and everything else will stay behind. In these columns here, we have what they call the spirit dance going on. Um, that is very highly proofed malt whiskey coming through um, each of these levels. That is a beautiful thing. Can I have a, can I have a shower like that? Yeah, just un unscrew it and stick your head right in there. Wow. So this That's is amazing. the barreling side of the room. Mm -hmm. Everything after the still, basically. For vodka and gin, no time spent in the barrel. We just proof them down, filter them, bottle them, and send them out to the stores and restaurants. But for our rum and both of our whiskeys, they spend a considerable amount of time here in the barrel. This is key to all the American whiskeys and rums and stuff. It's black on the inside. Is this, uh, this is burnt? Yes, this is actually a charred barrel. So they burn the inside this being a stave of the barrel. Everything comes out of the still perfectly clear. So this is that rum that we saw upstairs that's brown in color there. Right, right. It comes out of the still perfectly clear and it's only through time in that charred barrel that it picks up all that color and a lot of the flavor. The barrel's porous, so in the years that we leave it to age, the uh, booze will actually seep into the barrel as the temperature and pressure builds in the summer, then recede out of there all the way to that red line in the winter. So there's all that vanilla and caramel flavor and the charred sugar in the wood, and as it seeps in and out, that flavor gets picked up in the whiskey. So some of your batches, the, you'll notice a slight difference in taste and... and yep. Uh, you know, the barrels the develop color. over time. Yeah. Some give different flavors, and we leave them for different amounts of time, so three to five years. Some will have a little more oak character. Mm -hmm. Some will have a little more butterscotch or caramel with the rum. And that's really my mom's gig. She has by far the best palate out of any of us. It's the, it seems to be the case with a lot of distilleries that the matriarch has the best nose and palate for blending and tasting. So basically- Certainly true with my family too. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty much still mother knows best. So yeah. that's my nice. life on a daily basis. <laughs> when we take the spirits out of the barrels, there's obviously all that charred junk in there and we wanna do what we call polishing it up. We can't filter it too much because we've just imparted a lot of flavor with the barrel. 
um, over the years of aging, we don't want to strip all that out. Right, right. We've got this activated carbon that goes in. We'll actually put that in. Bob calls it squid ink, but it's carbon. We'll shake it up. Uh -huh. You can see it sort of flowing around in there. Yeah. And if we leave that in too long, it'll strip all the color right out of there. Yeah, yeah. So some of these finer white rums that you see actually have been barrel aged to make them smoother and richer. Then they filter it back to clear which is what yeah. the consumer expects for a white rum. We have about 700 bottles to get done right. today, so All if you right. can do one or two. Bottles in the... Smells so good. <laughs> yeah, it's tough when you're sitting here. It does yeah. not taste a little bit. Uh, now, Uncle Sam wants us to make sure we get the proper amount of alcohol in this bottle. Right. So we have to weigh them. You see yeah, we're at 1366? Yeah. yeah. We gotta get to within two grams of 1371. Let's try that. I bet that's good. 1370, exactly. good that. man. And here comes the more tedious part, which is why you're here to work. All We're right. gonna do some labeling. So hold All on right, to that, nice. I'll show you how we do it. We've got our labels, which were locally produced in Magnolia, oh, by the way. Magical. Yep, so line up the butt of the bottle right against there. Okay. And just pull on that as you spin this. We've gotta label each barrel and bottle number on there. All right. Because these are one at a time. So this is single barrel. barrel 143. Barrel 143. Barrel number 143. And you're going to be bottle number 209. So cool. All right. right so we're, this is this is why. I this is the business end yeah. of things. We're going to yeah. take a little taste of the products. Right. That's clean. Wow. Wow. Oh yeah. So good. Yeah, it's definitely, I want to taste them back to back. <laughs> Very political reason to drink more. This one's a little teeny bit sweeter. Okay, you tell me. I like them both. Thank you so much for joining us on Awesome Gloucester. I hope you've enjoyed our show. If you know of any organization that would like to be featured on our show, please contact us. Thank you and have an awesome day. Washed up on shore